In today's economy, more people than ever are looking to buy and sell businesses. But how do you do it? Welcome to The Deal Board, presented by Transworld Business Advisors. Straight talk about real deals and real people. Listen to stories, interviews, and expert advice to help your business sale, merger, or acquisition process. Now, here are your business exit experts, Andy and Jessica. Welcome back, everybody. And today, um, we've got a special show. We talk a lot about the positives of buying or selling a business, but today we're talking about deal dangers, what to watch out for, um, horror stories, things that we don't want you to go through when you're selling your business. But we feel like it's important to share some of these messages and some of these stories. Yeah, I mean, we always have the things called the war stories. And there we have a lot of war stories doing this for over 40 years and having sold thousands of businesses. And some of the war stories, you know, are are really tough to listen to. And, they, and it hurts. I mean, I was just talking about this uh, earlier is that it's not like selling a house or a piece of commercial real estate. If you make a mistake in that deal, you still have your house or you still have the commercial piece of commercial real estate. And for the most part, they don't lose value. Right. But if you make mistake in selling your business, it can drastically affect the value or the ability to sell at all. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately there's, there's deal stories and you know, um, my husband Al comes and talks about one on the show. Like they're, if you make a mistake, you can lose your business through this process, unfortunately. Um, and we were talking about like laws and legal agreements and things. They, they do protect you, but they only go so far. Um, suing a buyer or suing somebody involved um, really doesn't solve some of these major issues that we're going to talk about today. And, and sometimes the litigation, it just comes down to it's, it's not worth it. You're not going to recover enough money to get back to whole again. So we don't want today to scare you. No, no, but it's a lesson yeah. and things that you shouldn't do in selling your business. Uh, there's plenty of, uh, of a few war stories that come to mind with me, but some of the things that you shouldn't do is you shouldn't tell your employees before the sale is over. Right. Right. Yeah. So we've kind of grouped some of like the lessons. There's so many things that can go wrong and that's why leaning on your advisors is so important. But one is, you know, following the process. And one of the big steps we see people skip in the process is telling their employees before the deals closed. And, uh, we recently had a client in the construction industry. They wanted to ho hold the meeting. It was, I mean, we were close. We were like 48 hours out from closing, but they really wanted to tell their employees before closing, before the final agreements were signed. Um, and the deal didn't go through. And unfortunately that does happen even as close as 48 hours out. Um, and now the, the company's reeling, trying to figure out, you know, how do they, how do they pull this back from their employees and say, actually, no, it's not sold. And, and now they're thinking about not selling it. And it's also, it's not a roller coaster ride. You really want to put your employees through. It's not really fair to them. Um, no, they, yeah. they don't have any really control over it. And one of their only piece of control is, uh, which is kind of counterintuitive is they think they need to find another job or they need to quit, which is counterintuitive because the buyer needs to stay the employees more than ever. In fact, they're valued higher by the buyer, often given raises, often given incentives to stay. And so the better thing to do is not tell them, I know they're close to you. I know they've been with you for 20 years. I know they've been in integral employees, but we've seen bad things happen. One of the bad things I saw one time was in a Marine business. They told the employees early on, and the manager created a competitor and left. Yeah. And the buyer got freaked out and didn't close the deal. And, you know, it took a while for the, the, the seller to eventually get back the business and kind of restructure it. But, you know, years. Yeah, it takes, it takes a long time and it affects the value. I mean, the other big thing in following the process is not bringing the buyer into the business before the deals close. So we get asked this by a lot of buyers, but some sellers too, of like, well, why don't we let the buyer work in the business for, you know, a couple months and see how it goes? Um, the story never really ends well, does it, Andy? No, it doesn't. I, I mean, even for my business, I remember when I bought my pasta business, uh, working in the pasta business was, was shocking. I mean, that's what happens. It's often shocking to a buyer uh, that how much work is involved. They're not used to standing on their feet. They're not used to working so hard. They're super confused in the first two days. I've actually had buyers call me within a week of buying a business and want to sell. And they, you know, and I always say to them, I said, give it a month and then call me back. And you give it a month and they're all happy. But you give them a day in that business, 
they're going to want to leave. Yeah. I mean, and we've talked a lot about it on the show. Most of the buyers for small businesses, people listening to the show are going to be individual buyers, like what we call retiring from corporate and moving into entrepreneurship. They've never been an entrepreneur at all. They haven't worked the 50 hour weeks. They don't know what to expect. And the first six months, honestly, can be a little rough. We get a lot of those calls yeah, the first I mean, six months. Yeah, I mean, some of the corporate guys are looking for the button to call their secretary to get them coffee. Right. And that's yeah. not happening. You know, they're, they're not used to actually having to make deliveries or they fire employees themselves or actually having to roll up their sleeves and do some of the work. And this is shocking to a lot of people. And, but they get over it. They do get over it and you should never tell that you should never let them in your business. I mean, you know, and the big, big thing is they want to verify the revenues. I, and I always tell the buyers, well, how, you know, that's really going to be, I mean, if I was the seller and, and you were solely basing what happened in a few days that you, you were in the business, I'd call up every single one of one of my friends and have them come by. Right. Exactly. So it's not really going to mean anything. Yeah. It's not going to accomplish that much. I mean, it creates more problems than it, it's going to solve problems. And and a lot of the times we see it, it kills deals. It can also create a competitor for you. Um, you know, we've had, we had a, a deal where the buyer wanted to work in the business for six to eight months. We said it was a really bad idea. Um, and then after a while, the buyer was like, I could just do this on my own. Like why, yeah, why, why am I paying for yeah, it? Exactly. I've got all the contacts now. I've got the vendors. Maybe yeah. even the employees. Exactly. So that's one big thing in the process. Another big thing is, you know, see the whole process through. So once you sell your business at the very, very end, there's a lot of transitions that goes on and um, your broker will help this, help you with this. But Andy, I know you've one really bad war story about like one last transition piece didn't happen in a business with merchant services or something, right? Yeah. I mean, we've seen this before in merchant services or licenses for liquor licenses and things like that. And what they do is they want to get the deal done. So they let the buyer come in and something bad happens. So the merchant services one where the seller, uh, they couldn't get it done quickly. Uh, the buyer had to apply, open up licenses, whatever, had to get his EIN number going. What I mean, some of these buyers come to the closing table sometimes and they're completely unprepared. Um, so so they let the seller uh, keep the merchant services open so they could continue to run the business. Well, guess what the seller did? The seller didn't give them the money. The the it's going into the bank account of the seller and they didn't turn over the money. And it was a cash deal, small little deal. I mean, these small deals seem to have more problems than some of these big deals, right? Yeah, well, I mean, there's usually less vetting on both sides. There's less paperwork. Um, it's also more apt to, you know, break some of these deal dangers that we talk about, like not following the process because people are like, oh, it's a small deal. We're good. We trust each other. Let's just move forward and get it done. Um, so another big thing we've, we identified as a deal danger is not always accepting the highest price offer. Um, and this is one, I think if you're selling your business, you have to do some soul searching and figure out like, why are you really selling and what's most important to you? And I think most people, when they first come to us, it's about the money, right? Yeah. It's usually about the money and you know, you got to have going eyes wide open. And we have a couple of stories today, one from Henry Ziff, two from Henry Ziff about not accepting the highest price. And then uh, of course, Al Fiakovic was in uh, talking about that as well. Yeah. And I, I think you have to, when you look at a deal, you have to look at the deal holistically. So you have to look at the price. You have to look at, you know, how are your employees going to be treated? What's the legacy of the company going to be? Also, and we've talked about this on the show, most of the people who sell businesses are going to have some form of seller financing, whether it's a seller note or an earnout. So you want to be selling to somebody that you trust that will ensure the con continuity of the business moving forward. And that might not always be the highest offer that you get. Yeah. I mean, uh, Peter Berg sold a very large transaction here in Florida. Uh, recently, it was in a very niche business. Strategic buyer came through. They did all these interviews, and they they did all these interviews with, uh, with, with, with the sellers, and, and the sellers made assurances that uh, pieces of equipment in the factory were good. And the seller was telling us, again, another deal with the devil. But he knew it was a deal with the devil, and it was a big deal. And he said, listen— I think the buyer is going to come in and shut this whole place down. And we were like, no, we don't think so. The buyer keeps asking questions about the facility and keeps doing inspections on some of the equipment. 
And uh, he's like, no, I know these guys. They're going to do it. He goes, but it doesn't matter. I'm going to take care of my employees. Uh, I, I'm going to give them some of the proceeds from the sale. And they and they understand. Um, they'll understand. So day after the, they buy it, they shut down the whole factory. Wow. And they kept, they kept about 20% of the staff for their factory, uh, which was on the other side of the state. But... Again, the, he went in eyes wide open and, you know, and things like that. And so if you're going to choose price, that's what's going to happen sometimes. Right. And and you just have to be prepared for that, of knowing that if you're choosing price, you know, that might not be the best buyer that's going to develop the legacy of your company. Yeah. Um, I think another thing that, you know, I, I had a friend that went through this and a colleague is sometimes you have the potential highest um, purchase price. So sure. you'll have the earn out and you see a lot of this with private equity deals and larger deals where there'll be a potential earn out um, that's going to be based on your gross revenue or cash flow or something like that, some metric, but it's not guaranteed. Um, and I've seen a couple deals like this now where the buyer wasn't the best one to run the business and the earn out metrics were not hit. And sometimes you don't get, don't get all your money. I mean, my, my colleague got about 30% of what he thought he was going to get. Yeah, we had a big deal in the commercial real estate space where a commercial realtor was selling to one of the major companies. I won't mention which one. Uh, and we did some due diligence. We found out that they didn't pay their earnouts very often. And we really dug in. We dug in hard and we were questioning them on a conference call one day. And literally one of the vice presidents of this major national firm said on the phone, said, well, why would we set up our earnouts where we would be likely to pay them? And the seller said, because that's what you're trying to get me to sell your company for. And I'm counting on that. And they're like, well, no, we don't set them up. So we have to pay them. And the deal was over. I mean, but at least we found that out. And then he sold to another multinational company. And he's very happy at the, that place. And it wasn't the same. It wasn't as big of a price. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, sometimes, you know, if it, it's the old saying, if it's too good, it, too good to be true, it's right. probably not a good deal. And, yeah, you know, and that kind of dovetails into one of mine is you don't want to tell your vendors you don't want to tell your suppliers uh, it, up front. And, you know, even though they're a very specific supply, there are kind of ways to do it. Um, we've seen where we've had to tell the supplier because, listen, if, if it's a sole supplier or a dealership, you kind of have to float the idea that you're going to take in a partner perhaps and then slowly get over the fact. But one of, one of, my, one of our deals, it was up in New York, it was for a company that supplied medical um, equipment. I don't want to say more, but it was medical vehicle equipment, uh, and emergency response vehicles, a uh, very high end business, three locations, dealerships, uh, that were specific in, uh, geography. And he felt it was important to talk to them. And he had a, you know, 30 year relationship with them. And he would just tell them that he's going to sell his business and just to make sure that it was okay. And it wasn't okay. And they pulled his dealership eventually, wow. illegally, mm -hmm. and gave it to one of his competitors that probably would have bought it, but he needed to tell him. And I told him not to do it. I told him, let's let's ask for forgiveness and not permission. You know, let's go to the deal all done. And because if you go to the deal before it's all done, and you have, you know, he went and there was no deal. Right. And the problem is, is when they violated that, it just cost him his business or his future business. But they were like, hey, you were going to retire anyway. If if we have a deal in place and they cost you a deal, a big deal, right? there's millions at stake. And they realize that if they don't transfer it, they could be sued for that. So he would have been much better off holding back that information. Yeah. And I think this all wraps up. And there's a, there's a lot of things that can go wrong in deals. And, and, you know, thanks to Al and Henry, we've got some great interviews talking about that stuff. But, you know, not the the biggest thing is don't kick your broker out of the deal. Don't oh. kick your advisors out of the deal. Um, and we know things can go wrong with advisors sometimes, but 
really to have professionals on your team that have seen this. I mean, Transworld's done thousands of deals, does thousands of deals every year. Um, and your attorneys, same thing. Attorneys, your CPAs, they see all kinds of crazy stuff that happens and they're prepared to handle all of these hurdles. Yeah, if if someone is asking you to get rid of Transworld or a, a fellow intermediary, that's a red flag. Right. Yeah. So that's someone who doesn't like the fact that we're going to keep the deal fair or advocate for you. And they're trying to get us out because we're, you know, like, you know, you wouldn't, when you go to mom or dad, you're going to go to the easier one. Right. So they're trying to get us out of the deal because we're going to somehow not let them take advantage of you. And we've seen this over and over again. If an attorney all of a sudden drops in on, in on a deal and says, Cut the broker out. Tell him not to talk to me anymore. Otherwise, I'm not going to help you close the deal. Same with the buyer. If a buyer drops in and says, cut your broker out, you don't need to pay them or you don't need to, and it turns into a nightmare. Yeah. And it can come across too as like, oh, you know, we've, we've got this whole thing worked out ourselves. We got it now. Like we can close out this deal ourselves. And, and sometimes it is innocent, right? Sometimes it is. Sometimes it's a red flag and a buy, there are buyers out there that are looking to take advantage sure. of sellers. Sometimes it's innocent and, you know, you as a seller or a buyer might just go into a transaction. You just don't know what you don't know. Yeah, there's, I mean, they're outright scams. A lot of stock yeah. sale issues. Uh, I've seen a lot of people, uh, there's been some families, uh, hucksters that have gotten in trouble over the years that have bought a business based on a stock sale and because of existing either inventory or accounts receivables or some sort of vendor relations, they bankrupt the company, literally bankrupt the company and stick the old seller with, uh, you know, personal guarantees and stuff. And, and their, their reaction was, Hey, there's nothing wrong with, uh, and I've seen people do these deals. There's nothing wrong with, uh, taking a company bankrupt. It's, part of the legal laws, but it's, it's a nightmare. So if somebody's trying to get you to sell on a stock sale with no good reason for it, and we know all the good reasons why you might mm -hmm. want to do a stock sale license issues, leases, contracts, there might be good reason, but if there's no good reason and they want you to close on a Friday and they, they don't, they'll wire you the money on Monday. These are all huge all red, red flags. flags and things again, your job is to run your business. Your job is to be an expert in your industry. It's it's your advisor's job to be an expert in the transaction. So like we said, we don't talk about these, these deal dangers a lot, but sitting here prepping for this show, we had a really hard time of calling down, all right, how do we tell the best stories? How do we yeah. categorize? Because there's so many, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, and there's, there's a lot of things that can happen. So we hope that the show is informative to you. If you um, have a question, if you're in a situation right now that you're a little worried about, please feel free to reach out to us uh, through the dealboardpodcast.com. We're here to help. Uh, we have experts all over the country. Yeah, we hate to see people do bad deals and they're hard to unwind. So if we could catch it before it closes, uh, we may be able to restructure it and take it to market. Or we could just give you plain good advice because again, we're more than willing to be good corporate citizens out there in the world of doing deals. Yeah. So hope you enjoy the show and let's jump into it. Transworld Business Advisors is the world's largest business brokerage and mergers and acquisitions firm with over 500 brokers in nearly 200 offices worldwide. Transworld's team handles thousands of business sales every year. To be connected with a qualified business broker or learn more about the buying and selling process, visit tworld.com forward slash the deal board or call 888-719-9098. Hey everybody, welcome back. And I have a great guest. I have Al Fiakovich from Transworld Business Advisors of Rocky Mountain. Uh, he is one of the leaders in our industry. I am so happy to have him here in person in our studios here in Florida. He is uh, on tour of the United States as always. Welcome, Al. Uh, Andy, thanks for having me. I'm so glad to be here. So we are talking about deal dangers, talking about bad things that happen in deals, not following the process. And, you know, this, this was a good case of where, you know, everybody thinks that they have a great deal, and then all of a sudden want to cut us out. So why don't you give us a little bit of background to what happens? Yeah, sure. No problem, Andy. So this is a deal that this is going back five years, probably. 
the this company did was in a very very small niche industry in the medical software and there was probably in the country less than 10 people that did this and when we're doing a needs analysis with the client we asked who are your top competitors obviously and and they said the top competitor, they, I think they said they're the devil <laughs> <laughs> and we'd never sell to them regardless of price, et, right. et cetera. So what ended up happening is that we brought a really great buyer that was, it was a private equity firm out of California, some really, really sharp guys that owned a number of different businesses and they were going to do some really cool things. I think the business employed about 20 people or so. They were going to do some really cool things with the business and the sellers really cared about their employees. Then here comes the, the number one competitor that they thought was the devil. Right. Yeah. And then at that point they cut us out and the deal, it was, it was multiple millions. We had the deal under LOI for, and, uh, it ended up, it was, it was kind of a sad story. What happened in the end, I think it was around a million dollar breakup fee the the competitor basically broke their non compete and and they were suing each other. It lost about a million dollars. Oh, the, uh, geez. Well, they they got. Well, about they made a, million, a deal with the devil. They made obviously. a deal with the devil. Jeez. Got about a million dollars for the business, and that was about it. And they could have probably had five times that had they done our deal because there was bad faith going into it. But end of the day, they only cared about the money and. That's one of the things. If if you care about the money, care about the money. Let's just be honest with yourself and don't don't make it something it's not. Yeah, and one of the things that they did, and you know, of course, we, you know, we, I don't want it to sound like sour grapes that we were cut out of the deal and we could have saved it, but that that happens a lot. I mean, when when somebody wants to take advantage of someone, be very aware when they come to you because I know what happened. It might not have been the company that you were working with, but it was the competitor, the devil. The devil comes in and yeah. says, by the way, we're happy to buy your company. We're going to give you more money than what you have on mm -hmm. the table now, but you need to cut the broker out. Yeah. Cut. And then they do something bad. Yeah. They, they breached the, the specifics. They breached the NDA and told all their top clients because they knew who they were bidding against. And because it was a contract for news cycle, because there were multi-year contracts and they lost all their contracts. So the company basically wasn't worth anything after that. Right. So it, and was, it was totally sad. It, it's very sad. And we've seen it happen before. Uh, it certainly won't be the last time, but if they would have kept us in the deal and they really would have had a competitive process, maybe the other uh, company would have paid more, uh, you know, would have upped the LOI or maybe you, you know, would have just told them, Hey, it is not worth, you know, it is not worth getting out of an LOI to get into another contract to, to try to, you know, raise the stakes minimally. I mean, you know, it, it, the best deal is always not the best deal, which we're, that's what we're talking about today. The, uh, with, the one with the most price. And if you make the wrong move, it could be deadly. It's, it's not like buying a house or selling a house. The house doesn't go away. No. Your company could go away, though. It, yeah, I'm pretty sure the company went away. <laughs> <laughs> so that happens, and I'm not laughing at it. I'm just laughing that, you know, we deal with this so many times. So thank you, Al. Thank you for that lesson. Uh, really appreciate it. No, no problem. And just one more point is that following, if, if buyers are following our process, we can really protect the client from this. And I, I think that's one of the most valuable ads that we can do because we we see things coming that other people just don't. Yeah, we see it coming. And these are some of the things that we're talking about today. So agreed. Thank you, Al. Thank you. Hey, Andy, do you know what time it is? It's time for our deal of the week. Deal of the week. Sold. Welcome back, everybody. And our deal of the week this week is presented by Patrick Bombardier from our Transworld Rocky Mountain office. Welcome back to the show, Patrick. Thanks, Jessica. Thanks for having me. So you recently had a very good transaction, a great example of us doing good deals for good people. But tell us a little bit about this closing you just had. Yeah, happy to tell you about it. It was um, this was really for uh, it was a donut shop, it was a local donut shop, and it was the classic in the best sense of the word, word uh, mom and pop operation. It literally was a husband and wife who had been in the community in, in this community donut shop for forty years, and and they had um, that was their life. They started this business when they were in their twenties and been, had been making donuts every night, seven days a week together 
for all that period of time, they were beloved in the in the community, but they were ready to retire, both physically and, and mentally ready. Their kids didn't want to do the business. They had gone on to college and professional careers, and they were just looking for someone to, to take over the, the legacy of, of the business. Wow. I'm making donuts every night together for that long. That's amazing. Talk about some big shoes to fill. So, you know, where did you find the buyer from? Well, you know, it was interesting. We had we had it listed for a, you know a little bit longer than than probably anybody would have hoped, but it, a lot of it had to do with the fact that you did have to find the right person, the person who, from a, a family life standpoint, could work from midnight to five a.m. making donuts and fit that in, but also the person who is going to passionately care about their customers and and getting the product right. Um, we found the um, the buyer through um, our internet advertising. They were on our website. And it was a woman who had a passion for baking, who wanted to be a baker, and, and her and her husband were just trying to figure out how do they make the leap from her leaving her corporate job to them owning a business where she could do her passion. And so it was just really kind of serendipitous where they inquired and, and they met and, and had a connection and, and it went, it just you know took off from there. Wow. Talk about most probable and perfect buyer, a baker looking for to own their own business. That's amazing. So tell us a little bit about the transaction. What did the business sell for? What was the uh, multiple and how was it financed? So it sold for 240000 um, 249000 I think it was. And um, it was a really good multiple. I mean, the business was making a very steady and very clean $100,000, $110,000 a year. Um, uh, very steady over the years. It was done through SBA financing. There was no SBA involved in this one. There was no seller financing involved in this one. There was SBA involved. Um, and so it was all SBA financing and, and the owner's uh, new owner's money. And um, that's how we got it done. Um, it took a little bit longer. There were some things at the very end, the health department issues to get through and all that kind of stuff. But at the end, in the end, everybody was really, really happy. And, and uh, they're on to the new, both, both parties are on to the next chapter. Wow. Well, sounds like a great deal and a great situation for both parties. We wish, wish both parties luck. And thank you, Patrick, so much for coming on the show and telling us about the deal story. Happy to. Thanks so much. Hey, welcome back, everybody. And we are talking about deals and we're talking about what's the best deal to take. And one of the things that we wanted to talk about, of course, was and when we ever tell buyer, buyers and sellers all the time that Price is not always the determining factor for the best deal. Uh, you know, of course, you want to maximize your price, but as we've learned over the years, uh, it it is about a whole lot more than just the valuation and the eventual price you get. Uh, it's a, it's about a lot of other things. And Henry uh, Ziff from Trans World Business Advisors of London is here with me today, and we are talking about it. And he's got really two good stories about this. So, Henry, welcome. And let's talk about two of your deals where you know price wasn't the wasn't the final thing that they that they considered uh, when taking the deal. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me back on the podcast, Andy. And yeah, so I kind of got two situations that have happened recently where. Price wasn't the determining factor. So um, we recently closed a dentist deal where um, the seller, what was really, one of the things that was really important to the seller, apart from obviously kind of getting a good price for their business was who was going to buy the business and look after his customers that, or cl uh, patients that he had looked after for the previous kind of 10 years. So we had three offers on the table. Um, one offer was from a national chain of dentists um, a second offer was at a higher price from a first time buyer um, who was looking to buy a business, buy a dental practice for his son. And the third offer, which was the one that was accepted, was kind of was the same price as the national chain. But she was going to look the buyer uh, was kind of had five or six practices and had great kind of testimonials and reviews in terms of how she looked after her clients. Um, and that was really important to our seller. So the seller went with that went with that offer. Yeah, I, I've seen that before. Uh, we were selling a, a psychology practice once upon a time, and uh, and it was a, it happened to be a woman seller. And the woman who was talking, she she talked that she wanted someone that was going to fit and someone that would take care of her patients. And she really felt that it needed to be another woman. And we had multiple offers on that psychology practice, and she did go with someone who she felt. A, Mimic Terry. Actually, we used to kid. They actually, we felt they actually looked alike. So not that they would 
con- confused the, the patients, but uh, you know, it, it they it just was the right fit. Uh, and you know, sometimes they even the dentists and medical practitioners want to know they have the same philosophies about treatment, right? Yeah, exactly. You know, it's it's not always price and money. It's about kind of that legacy and continuation of their business. Yeah, and a lot of times they want to see that their employees are going to be well taken care of as well. Yeah, that's always really important. Okay. And so you had another transaction this yeah, course so, of thing? Uh, sorry to interrupt, Andy. Yeah, so I had a second transaction recently where we had two offers on the table. So this was, the first offer was from a first-time buyer who offered, can I quote numbers? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so offered kind of 425 um, and was looking to actually leverage themselves and the business uh, to kind of the max to acquire the business. And we had a second slightly lower offer from a more kind of strategic buyer. He'd bought three three or four businesses before at 350. Um, so I sat down with our seller and, you know, he the seller is looking to retire. It's his pension. He wants to do right by the company and right by his employees as well. Um, but went with a lower offer because it was the safer offer, safer offer for him and safer offer for the kind of legacy of his company that he's run for the last 30 years. Yeah. And, and you know, so it's so funny because we talk about valuation and people are trying to drill down the multiples and people are trying to drill down exactly what happened in the deal. And they're looking at all these data points. And this is the kind of stuff that's behind the data point. Like, so that was a 20, over a 20% difference, right? Yeah. Exactly. I mean, 425 down to 350, right? Yeah, exactly. So, so $75,000 on a three hundred and fifty thousand dollar deal is over 20 percent yeah it's a it, look it's a lot of money but it's about what the seller wants to do you know what the seller feels comfortable with um and yeah it's it's you know it's not necessarily our decision we all we do is kind of advise and provide the guidance to our clients um but this yeah fundamentally the sellers have to make their own decision in terms of what's the, what are the most important things for them whether it's the it, like the money um or other things and we see a lot of times where it's not about the money. I mean, you know, people are in their businesses, they're selling it for two or three times. So they're certainly not selling it because they want a bucket load of money, because if they stayed for two or three more years, they'd make that money. So when they're selling, it's for another reason, retirement. And and so a lot of times it's, they've built this baby. It's their baby. It, that, this is exactly this example. So this guy's run this business for 30 years. Um, it was a much bigger business. 10 years ago. Um, but he, you know, he's kind of been that kind of owner, that typical owner operator we've seen, um, that has run their business kind of almost like a lifestyle. Um, but he does, you know, there's a couple of employees, there's some clients, longstanding clients that he wants to make sure the right thing happens with them. Um, and it's, he's kind of calculated how much he needs and wants, and he's okay with that amount. Yeah. And we've seen that a lot. And you've seen that in your other deals too. And, and again, we're talking to Henry Ziff, uh, from London. So, uh, if you're listening to this in the United States and you don't think that these, these things are worldwide, uh, norms. I mean, you know, this is what happens. It's, it's, you know, we, we try to drill down to valuation points and we try to drill down to exactly what a business is worth based on, uh, revenues, based on earnings, but we always forget that there's this huge human psychological element that comes into play at the end. Absolutely. You know, and, it, it, every day. Right. And the ability uh, for the buyer or what we believe, we all perceive, of the ability of the buyer to get the deal done. We've seen that before, too. Yeah, exactly. You Who's know, going to get through due diligence? Exactly. That's and that and you know, that's part of it. That's part of working with would you want to work with a more strategic buyer or a first time buyer where they're not necessarily sure what they're doing? Yes, there there's lots of resources. We we help coach those first time buyers through due diligence, through getting financing and funding and right. everything and through legals and contracts and everything else. But you know, the expo- experienced person is is sometimes the right answer. Yeah, agreed. Great, great subject. Glad I was able to cover it with you. It's great examples of everyday kind of deals that we do here at Transworld. And if uh, someone wants to get in touch with you in the UK, what's the best way to do that? Uh, thanks, Andy. Uh, a couple of different ways. So we can email us at hziff, that's H-Z-I-F-F at tworlduk.com. Um, give us a call on, o- on 0203-911-1059. 
or get in touch with us through the website at tworlduk.com. Thanks for coming in again, Henry. Thanks for having me, Andy. Hey, Jessica, you know what time it is? Money time? Almost. It's time for Listing of the Week. Welcome back, everybody. And today for our Listing of the Week, we have Dion Warsaw from our Utah County office joining us. Dion, welcome to the show and thanks for joining us. Thanks for asking me, Jessica. Happy to be here. Great. Well, just tell us, uh, the listeners, a quick little bit about yourself before we get into the listing. Sure. I am the co-owner of the Utah County office. We're located in northern Utah County in Lehigh, Utah, and that's our primary area. Great, great. Well, I know you have a listing to share in the catering industry uh, with the listeners. So why don't you tell the listeners a little bit about this business you have for sale? So this is a turnkey high-end catering business. It actually is located in Salt Lake County. We have known the owner for over 20 years. They've been in business for over 30 years and one of the top three venue event and corporate caterers in the state. Wow, that's great. So so what would be a good buyer for this business or somebody ideal that would be um, able to take over the business and continue it running? Someone with good managerial skills, they have a a nice um, culinary management team in place, and the owner is actually willing to stay on for up to three to six months to help um, transition in terms of the culinary side. But someone with strong management skills and strong marketing skills could really help grow this business. Oh, that would be great because I'm sure a lot of listeners are like, oh, well, catering business, I don't know how to cook. But if they have the kitchen staff and executive chef all in line, then really just a good business operator. Correct. Plus, they have one of the largest on site kitchens. So there's a 17,000 square foot space. Um, that can be either rented or purchased with the business. So it's a really a very high end premier business for someone that with good management skills, like you said. Great. Well, it's a great industry to get into. Tell us a little bit about the numbers. What's it listed for? What's the SDE? All that good stuff. So it's listed for one point four five million, and um, annual receipts are three point six million. Annual discretionary earnings are about. 255,000, but obviously there's always more than the numbers and there are some extenuating circumstances, um, but the potential for a much higher SDE is there. That's great. That's great. And Dion, if anybody wants to learn more information about this listing or any other listings you have in Utah, how can the listeners get in touch with you? Best way to get in touch with me is to call our office at 801 753 Five six five five, and the easiest way to get in touch with us is to use our general email, which is utahcounty at tworld dot com, because somebody will get back to you very quickly that way. Great, and we'll drop all that contact information into the show notes for the listeners as well. Dion, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing this listing, and best of luck. Thanks a lot, Jessica. Take care. Thanks for tuning into the show today. If you like the podcast, share it with your friends on social media. And don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review on your favorite podcasting app. If you have questions, would like to appear, or have suggestions for topics for the show, get in contact with us through our website, thedealboardpodcast.com.